What is up, people, and welcome to the show. My guest today is a rock musician, done rockabilly, done country, open for Johnny Cash, uh, appeared on a Kiss tribute CD, talked a lot, uh, a lot about Kiss, talked about Springsteen. He also hosts a Bruce Springsteen podcast. Has a brand new single called Train to Heartbreak, uh, which had a, a little bit of songwriting help from Steve Earle. So, um, really great guy, cool cat. Please enjoy the chat with the one and only Lee McCormick. So, yeah, so how you doing, buddy? I got the, the single right here. I'm holding awesome. it in my hand, looking yeah, at it right cool, now, man. and it's just—it's—I <laughs> love that it has the, um, like it, it looks like you know it looks like the old Sun Records like logo and all the stuff with the way it says Moon. That's just you know very cool, very classy. Since you recorded it at the studio, man, like I feel like the history like flowing through the vinyl in my hands. <laughs> that's cool. That's what I was going for, right? Like I did a mock up of the Sun label. My band is Moon Violet. And then, uh, like, this is the first record I'm releasing kind of under my, my own name. So I figured, oh, it'd be cool to put, like, you know, my, my kind of music company is Moon Violet Music. So it'd be cool to put the uh, the moon instead of the sun kind of thing, right? Right. <laughs> no, I just, the, the thing is, like, a, a lot of my friends put out stuff on vinyl. And I, like, truthfully, most of them, I'm like, man, I don't care. <laughs> like, I got your CD. I can stream it. But the fact that this was recorded, yeah, yeah. like, at Sun Studio, like, you, you just... The magic of the room, man. We're just like, shit, like, this is where, you know, the Million Dollar Quartet was just jamming. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, Johnny awesome, Cash man. and Elvis in the same room just jamming together, and just now you're there, like... Uh, well, dude, dude, yeah, it was just, it's, it's the whole thing, man. It's, a, it's such a huge thrill for me to do that. And so many years I've been there as a tourist, you know, and, and done, done that tour, like, maybe over 15 times, right? And I just love the vibe there, and now to actually record some music there it was just uh you know just amazing right and yeah so cool to put it out on a vinyl record right at 45 and here's the two songs recorded at sun studio it's right it's you gotta do it it's, it was uh it was amazing right yeah the packaging looks great you know the uh yeah buddy of mine did the uh, the artwork for me and he did a great job on the cover making it look all kind of uh you know vintage vintage and everything you know <laughs> yeah dude i'm 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 super like happy with it and just you know there there are um you know how like when you're when you're a musician and a lot of your musician friends like suck and you're very polite about it. I like that I don't have to do that with you and you're actually good, so I can just say, oh, oh sweet, sure, I can yeah. just because <laughs> you, you know what that's like. We're just like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll go to your show and buy the CD. But this is like this is like actually cool. Like there's there's magic in it, man. I feel the magic. That's just so awesome. Oh, that's cool. I appreciate that, man. I'm glad you like it. Like, I'm glad you like the song. And I think I did a pretty good job on it, right? Like the, the song, uh, train to heartbreak was actually an older song I had called train of heartbreak. And I wrote th that about 10 years ago. And a uh, quick little story. There's uh, I've been to Steve Earl's uh, masterclass songwriting camp a few times, camp Copperhead. Uh, and, you know, that's like you're spending four or five days with him and he's doing like classes every day and you're hanging out and he's talking about songs. And the last time I was there in 2018, I think it was, and I got the opportunity to play this song in front of him, in front of the class, right? And mm -hmm. sitting there playing the, playing my song and he had the uh, the lyrics were up on it, like an overhead behind me, right? So I'm playing this song and there's Steve Earl, like just standing right there, like looking at my lyrics and I'm playing them, right? And then afterwards he gave me a little like, you know, a couple, three or four minute critique. He's like, yeah. Yeah, it's a good song. It goes uh, train of heartbreak. I want a train to heartbreak, right. right? And he gave me a couple of other uh, things. You might want to cut this verse. It's a little long. You need to throw a solo in there. You it's like this word here is a little clunky. This right. So it was awesome that I was able to get some some pointers from one of my Where's heroes. Where's his co-writing credit, man? Hey, dude, I told him, I got this on tape. I said, I said to him, I go, after, after the critique, I'm like, Steve, can I keep the publishing on that? And he's like, yeah, you can have it, you can have it, right? So, so yeah, he gave it to me, man. He gave it to me. Right, he, and, gave, uh, he gave you a freebie. He's like, nah, it's all right. <laughs> You're all good, man. Yeah, so it's awesome. And I've had the opportunity to, to meet him a bunch of times since the, uh, the the songwriting camp. And he sort of knows me the like th of the last few times I've kind of, went to say hi after a show he's like he's like lee right so he kind of knows my name right so i can't i can't wait to be able to give him this single and be like yeah here's this, that song that you now that's to, awesome you to. yeah so yeah that'd be cool <laughs> yeah it's it's always cool when the the heroes recognize you 
yeah, they're not assholes. They're good guys too, right? right? So, uh, yeah, you know, so, not, so, not all so, of them are like that. <laughs> they're not, they're not, right? So, yeah, so twofold. Here's a song that, you know, I worked on, you know, sort of with Steve Earl. He, he like, I, <laughs> you know, forced, like, Steve Earl sort of mentored me on this song, and here I am recording it at Sun Studios. So that's, it's, uh, that was amazing, right? Yeah, dude, that's just, it's just, yeah, you know, I, I keep just my eyes keep uh, darting towards the vinyl just because it looks so cool. I think yeah, it I'm looks show, cooler, you know right? What? I'm yeah. gonna show it in front of the screen again. You know what? It, does this count as product placement for YouTube? Shit, I don't know, but it's rad. That's what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we've we've been buddies for a while, and like you know, I've I've heard you know some of your music, um, just you know through hanging out with you and you sending me stuff. Um, yeah. And how long have you been on the streaming services? Because I've only recently discovered your stuff on the streaming services, like, you know, in the last, like, you know, couple months is when I've really well, I've noticed been, it. Yeah, well, I've been kind of promoting it the last few months, right? Because I've kind of, I've been doing it for 10, 20 years, right? I put out CDs, uh, 99 was my first CD. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, and then that, that was on uh, iTunes then and all that stuff. And Spotify, it's been on Spotify since. So, like, it's, my music is set up to be, streamed in uh all on all the uh the platforms and the, and the downloading and streaming services so like my stuff's always been there but the last you know three or four months i've kind of been promoting it a little bit gearing up for this single release so i've kind of redid my website i had a website and it was just sort of old and clunky so i kind of just uh, got rid of that and i'm still using moonviolet.com as the website but now it just directs to my my facebook uh page which i'm easier it's easier for me to uh update and, and just you know i get out of it what i need it for right so uh so yeah man and this song is on uh uh you know apple music and the spotify and all that stuff too so uh it's cool but the vinyl you gotta have the vinyl right, right. it sounds so cool and i think i was able to capture some of that that sun sound on it right like i, I listened to it in comparison to some of the other music i've recorded over the years and there's definitely a sound to this right like we recorded it mixed it in mono and uh we were trying to get these sounds like similar to what Sam Phillips got in the in the fifties when he was recording Elvis and Jerry Lee and Roy Orbison and all those great records and the sound there's just a sound to those those records right so we would listen to like Blue Suede Shoes and then we would you know put my mix up and we would try to like mirror it back and forth and like when you do when you think of it like when you really analyze these songs you might be like yeah I don't e- I don't even hear a bass drum like it's just not even there so it's just a, a compressed sound and you're just kind of going for that that feel that sort of vibe instead of like being able to i need to be able to hear everything uh precisely and all that stuff right so i think we were able to uh capture it i'm very proud of how this song turned out i love that you uh released in mono i'm just like man that's the way to yeah. do it yeah that's what that's what i wanted like mono <laughs> 45 rpm i wanted like a uh, a seven inch record i wanted black vinyl i didn't want like colored white vinyl or something stupid right i wanted black <laughs> I, I wanted the big hole i didn't want the little hole right so yeah i wanted that mono sound like all those sun records are all mono right all the yeah. elements stuff that's all right it's all mono right so it's when you hear it that way it's like yeah it's the sound man mono's cool right <laughs> uh, yeah there's i think just there are a number of people who just uh like, cause Steve is one of those guys who's just like, man, I'm so glad recording technology got better. And he's always about like, whatever's the most current technology is the best. And I think there's, um, there's something to be said about the charm of, of old records where, I mean, yeah, the technology, it might not be as crisp and clear, but there's something it just does to your soul that you're not yeah. getting with the Pro Tools recording. Like, you know, just, you know, mono at Sun Studios, the spot where Elvis stood, you know, that old equipment. It just, it it, it has this majesty and magic to it that you just don't get. And, and it's not to say you can't make great stuff with modern technology, don't get me wrong, but I'm saying that I feel that there's a, there's a number of people younger folk my generation sorry about that but you know my, my generation there's like oh, i don't like how old music didn't have as much technology but you know you're they're missing out on all the great stuff that is there and sometimes that lack of technology led to innovation and cool sounds you wouldn't get otherwise yeah absolutely like you think of what they were um mixing these records to sound like too like they wanted like car radios like that was a big thing right like transistor radios car radios uh, so, like, there was only usually one speaker in, like, a 57 Chevy, right? You didn't have four speakers. It was just usually, like, one speaker in the dashboard. And AM radio, like, that sound of AM radio. Like, I never listen to the radio anymore because they, they just play all shit, right? But <laughs> I love the I loved that sound of an AM radio, right? Like, hearing – like, I can imagine hearing this song on an AM radio, 
kind of thing, right? Like, it's just, it's cool, right? So I, I dig those sounds. It brings me back. You're talking about records and vinyl and stuff like that. Even when you get, like, an old scratchy record, right? Like, I'll take all those imperfections with the pops and the crackles and the hisses because, like, there's still this, like, this music in, in, in those grooves that, like, just breathes more than, like, a CD or a, a, a you know, a digital file or something like that, right? So uh, most of the time, right, it's, it's you know, the, I'm sure you can – always find some records that sound like shit but right. you know there's always there's some great records from like the 50s that you'll still play and you'll just be like wow like it just captures the sound right yeah sort of my uh stance you know in the big uh, you know vinyl versus cd versus digital debate i tend to think that um digital sounds better most of the time asterisk vinyl sounds better if you have a sweet sound system and i think that is the thing if you have a sweet sound system vinyl can't be beat and for that, sure, that's yeah. Because you get just the – it just sounds more organic. It sounds more earthy, live, real, and, and you just can't beat that. Now, granted, I have a really shitty record player, but uh, there's still like a certain charm where like even though I know I can go listen to this Thin Lizzy album, you know, digital, sometimes like, you know what? I know my record player is shitty, but there's something about just the magic of vinyl. It's just like I know this sounds like shit, but it yeah. just – it just it, it fe- you feel something in your soul. Where you're just like, shit, we're doing thunder and lightning on the record today. The other thing, too, about playing records, which is different than playing a cassette tape, playing a CD, playing a digital file, like it's like the process gets easier and easier with each new media, mm-hmm. right? Like cassettes were convenient, but then you got to rewind them. So then we're all going to CDs. Now we're going to, so we don't even have, have any physical media. But there's something about a record and just caring for the music, right? Like having it. You know, in the sleeve and pulling it out of the sleeve and making sure you can't, you don't get your fingerprints on this, holding it right and putting it on the turntable and sp- dropping the needle and making sure you don't scratch it. And then it just lays right in the grooves and it's just like, oh, right. So, like, it's like you're, it's a process. So you're really, in, you know, you're part of the, the process. You're not just pressing a button, you're actually making this thing sing. So, uh, you know, that's what I like about records too the, the process and the care and the, and the, you know, and then putting the, the, the outer sleeve on the on the LP jacket when you're done, you know, and keeping it all nice and pristine. <laughs> so I know that a lot of our mutual friends who are going to listen to the show uh, know who you are. But for, like, my my new audience who are super cool, super supportive, um, let them know a little bit about your background, like some of your, some of your musical influences, some of the, you know, adventures you've gone on musically, and also, you know, about how we uh, met through podcasts and all that stuff. So, you know, introduce sure. yourself to the folks at home. All right, well, I'll try not to talk too much about myself. It's uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm good at that, but uh, you know, I, I was I grew up from a very young age loving music. Like I had records when I was three or four years old. I had Elvis Presley records. I had my first LP was a Kiss record when I was five years old. You know, so I've you know I went to, going to concerts since I was eight years old. Always just you know huge into hard rock and heavy metal and all the all the eighties stuff and you know uh, rockabilly, Stray Cats in the early eighties. You know, I really got into rockabilly. Uh, loving all the old legends from the 50s and 60s, like Elvis and Johnny Cash and Rolling Stones and, uh, you know, Chuck Berry. Like these artists just mean so much to me. Always being a music fan, uh, you know, really learning, studying music when my teen years, taking uh, drum lessons is my first instrument. Uh, you know, soon after that, I learned how to play guitar, uh, always studying music. I From a very early age, I knew I wanted to go to uh, college and study, you know, music more perf- seriously there. Uh, I did that in my early 20s, uh, three years at Humber College in Toronto, playing a lot of jazz. I was there playing drums, but and also meeting so many great musicians in the Toronto scene and making connections that I still use to this day. And you know, starting to play a lot of gigs. Uh, my first gig out of college was I was a drummer in a country band. We went across uh, across Canada tour uh, for about, like 15 weeks or something like that. Playing it was it's kind of cool because we were playing like a bar like in Winnipeg. Uh, like Monday to Friday or something like that. Living at this bar, usually they would have like a band house rooms like above the bar. You would come down, you do four sets, right? <laughs> you know, right. And back up, One and then like on the gigs. yeah, and you're playing the covers, and it was like the mid '90s, right? So I'm playing all these uh, all the country stuff, like Garth Brooks and all all that, you know, Marty Stewart, and Dwight Yoakam, and all that stuff, right? And uh, but then on the weekends we would get these festival dates where they would have these country festivals. So you would be playing in front of like five, six, six thousand people, and sometimes we 
played with like Sleep at the Wheel and Tanya Tucker and Vince Gill. One show we did with Johnny Cash. Nice. Uh, oh, it was one of the greatest moments <laughs> of my life. Right? We played we we played the Saturday, and Johnny Cash was going to be there the Sunday. The mm. band had to like it was in BC, so the band had to like boot it back to Alberta right after the show to make a next gig. But I begged them. I said, I got to Can we? Can I stay an extra day? Because I try and meet Johnny Cash. They said, yeah, but you got to drive the bus all through the Rocky Mountains by yourself, right? So I'm like, yeah, I'll fucking do it. I was like, <laughs> I was like 22, 23, right? I'm like, yeah, I can do that, right? So I stayed and, I, you know, Johnny Cash was amazing. He, his bus pulled up to the backstage and I was there with a the backstage pass and stuff like that. And, you know, Johnny Cash didn't get off the bus. He kind of just stood on the bus. But I, I knew where he was going to walk. Right. So I just kind of parked myself there and just waited. And sure enough, like he got off the bus you know, and he, he was like probably like in the 70, uh, probably about 60 in his early 60s then. Mm -hmm. But he's he had a, like a stagger. He's something wrong with his leg. He's a big dude, though. Right. And he's walking up this this uh, this ramp. And he's holding on to this this railing. And I kind of just looked up and I said, have a good show, Mr. Cash. And he looked down and said, thank you, son. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was fucking awesome. And then so I, he played the show and I got to watch Johnny Cash from side stage. Right. So that was a uh, that was a big thrill. You know, so then, like, I guess after that, I played drums in so many cover bands and bar bands. I just got sick of playing covers and other people's music. And you're in these bars, and you're just kind of, like, background. No one's really paying attention. Yeah. Everyone's just getting drunk, and you're just like a jukebox. And I remember people used to, uh, that was when you could smoke in bars, too. Uh, so some of these gigs, I remember I would just be playing, and just the smoke and everything like that like so <laughs> so i was just like yeah i'm not gonna do that anymore so i'm, I'm really gonna try and write you my know, own someone songs. gives you a 20 dollar bill like play Freebird. yeah uh, yeah I, it was I, those gigs one of those right gigs. so so you're getting paid 100 bucks a night but after a while i just kind of like ah, i want to take a break from this so i started my own band moon violet started you know writing my own songs i had a female singer with me and we did one cd with her we did a bunch of cool kiss covers uh, Ace Fairly covers with her, Speeding Back to My Baby and Getaway. People might have heard those. And then, uh, you know, she, Dallas, she kind of moved on. She kind of got married, started a family, and kind of her rock and roll dreams weren't a priority anymore, right? So I kind of made the decision to, okay, I'm going to have to start singing because I never was confident with my singing. I always thought I'll be the sideman guitar player and I'll write all the songs and I'll have mm -hmm. a good singer with me, right? But then uh, I figured, you know what, you know, after being in bands and trying to hold a band together i'm just like i got i just got to do everything myself right so so i put the band together but the, it was always basically a solo project mm -hmm. whoever was playing with me at the time was my band moon violet but it was kind of just i was a one man kind of kind of show kind of thing right that so i was playing guitar and singing and made a few more records and it's kind of like roots rock uh country kind of stuff rockabilly trying some different things the last record i did the full length record was called rock and roll party and that was more of a kind of rockabilly one i i really wanted to try and go into like a rockabilly trio kind of stray cats meets johnny cash kind of vibe so yeah i did that in uh that was 2011 you know and it's not, it wasn't really a full-time career my music like you know it came to a point about 10 15 years ago where i realized that you know i'm not gonna make you know, a career out of this, like with be able to sustain myself, buy houses and houses, houses, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, stuff like that, right? So I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to get a real job and I'll keep this kind of music on, on, the, on the side kind of thing, right? So that's what I've been doing kind of for the last uh, 10, 15 years. Still playing side gigs. I've, I worked on cruise ships for a while, playing drums. Uh, you know, re more recently I've been playing uh, Ringo Starr in a Beatles tribute band. Uh, they, they, they play a lot of big cruise ships and, you know, big gigs like that. And yeah, which leads me to uh, my new single, Train to Heartbreak. You know, I'm still writing songs. I'm still keeping at it. And this was such an awesome opportunity to record a couple of songs at Sun. So uh, yeah, that's the little uh, <laughs> story on my music career, I guess. Yeah, it's actually, you know, it's very funny in a way where I remember uh, seeing that Return of the Comet um, CD all the time when I was in high school. And in Kiss circles, like everyone was like so excited about that, and then to find out years later, like oh shoot, that was late. That's pretty cool. Uh, just yeah. like it's 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 always funny when I just find out like my friends have been part of my life for a lot longer than I thought they were, and it's like it's both funny and also creepy how often that happens to me. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, the one story about that CD was awesome. Was I heard through the grapevine that uh, I think it was from John Regan told me that Ace really liked that my song on there because we had like a female singer like dallas was singing that mm. so it really kind of stuck out on that tribute cd which was basically all kind of hard rock 
do, like heavy metal covers of Ace right. Fairly, but here's this one kind of rockabilly song with a female singer, right? So I think John Regan told me like, yeah, Ace said he really liked that one, so you know, that was kind of neat, right? There you go, Pray, praise from the Ace. So um, yeah. another question I have for you: uh, a lot of people give Ringo shit as a drummer. What do you think about those oh, people giving him shit as a drummer? Uh, they're just not listening properly. They just don't know. They just hear the sim- they hear the simplicity of them, and they just think it's easy, but it's not. That's the genius of it, right? So. Yeah, like I, I've gone on forever about this. Like if you listen to any of those Beatles songs and just listen to the drum part, you can tell what song he's playing, right? He, he's the perfect drummer as far as like uh, keeping time. He's, he's a solid metronomic uh, guy in the studio. Like they could always rely on him for just laying down a solid beat, not speeding up, not slowing down. You know, the creativity of his parts is just perfect. You figure he's r- working with three of the greatest songwriters in the history of pop, rock, and roll music, right? right Paul McCartney, George Harrison, John Lennon. And here he is keeping up and making these incredible songs, like A Day in the Life, the drum part on that, or right. like uh, She Loves You, or like I could go on forever. In my life, in my life is just so simple, but it's just so tasty, right? And it's perfect. And, you know, like the Beatles would sound very different with any other drummer. So I think you, you can't discount, you know, the impact he has on those songs. And, uh, you know, if you don't think he's a good drummer, you're just not listening properly. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's something to be said about uh, arrangement and playing to the song, and I feel that it's something that a lot of musicians, in in my view, especially my generation, I feel like they just completely lost that ability. Like most musicians my age yeah. don't, like they don't understand that concept because they're kids that grew up on uh, Metallica, and don't get me wrong, like there's there's stuff to appreciate there, but it's like it's overplaying all the time, at least in early Metallica. And so yeah. if that's what you're learning from, you're just assuming overplay all the time, but you didn't learn those lessons of songwriting from those older guys, and I think that's where a lot of younger musicians are just like, in my opinion, dropping the ball. Well, I think what you got to do as a musician, this is what I've done, this is where I kind of got all of my music history knowledge, is that whatever you like, you just got to go trace it backwards. Like, if, you're, if you like Metallica, like, where does Lars... Ulrich get his influence from. I'll go back to Deep Purple. Where does Deep Purple get their influences from? Oh, you go back to like Little Richard, right? So that's what you got to do. And you hear how like Little Richard influenced Deep Purple, how Deep Purple influenced Metallica, right? How Metallica influences whoever. And, you know, you take those little bits that you like and you kind of, you know, put that all together with some of your own originality. And that's right. how you're supposed to become a, a good musician, I think. Right. So, you know, I don't know if kids are doing that these days. They're I know not. that there's kind they're, of, they're, they're going there's... to the, the first one and then they're not looking back any further. And I think that's like, yeah, really, like, especially when you have the internet and there's no excuse for that shit. Cause you can just like look that up so easily in the Wikipedia yeah. article. Who were they influenced by? Oh, let me check out a song of theirs. Like it's so to, to me, it's mind blowing that most musicians don't do that. And it just, it makes no sense to me versus, you know, you and I, like, you know, we go back to the classics, like, you know, we yeah, enjoy s- more, you know, stuff that, you know, came like decades later, but we'll still jam to little Richard because he's freaking little Richard. Yeah. And I'm such a fan of music, right? As I went back and as I started doing all this investigation and learning about, you know, I love the stray cats, but let me go listen to Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran and, right. Uh, you know, the rock and roll trio. And I hear these songs and I hear where the Stray Cats got it. And I, I love those guys just as much. Right. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, you, that's how you get turned on to so much good music. Right? So it's so I, yeah, I don't know, man. It's like I, I can't answer it because I'm not I'm, that's totally a different type of person than what I am. Right. So I just love it. I like I eat all that stuff up. If I like I don't really buy new music, to be honest, but I buy new music from older artists. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And I'm still finding like records from the sixties that I still haven't heard yet. Like I find that incredible that there's still stuff like, Oh, there's a little Richard box set that has, you know, a bunch of unreleased tracks from the fifties. I got to have that. Right. So, you know, that's the stuff I really love. So there's, there's just so much music out there. And, uh, yeah, I encourage everybody to just, you know, dig deep and find out who, where it all comes from. Right. The whole, the whole path of, the evolution of rock and roll. I love that stuff. Yeah, I, I really, I, I do believe in like the sort of importance of musical lineage and understanding musical lineage. But I, I also understand sort of how it, how it happened. Like if you look at the grunge revolution, that stuff was like a left turn that just said, let's ignore all that lineage and start something new right here, which I kind of get where like, you know, the younger generation doesn't want to go back and check out the lineage because it's, you know, that, that was deliberately throwing out the lineage. 
Which, but know, they're I, no, there's there's some lineage there. I mean, they're taking a lot from the punk rock movement of yeah, the seventies, I mean, right? They still and are. you look at a guy like Kurt Cobain. Like the reason Nirvana was popular and, the, and that why they've sustained is because Kurt Cobain was a good songwriter, right? Like you're nothing, you're nothing without songs, right? So that you're not telling me that Kurt Cobain wasn't influenced by Bob Dylan or Lou Reed or Bruce Springsteen or Tom Waits, right? Like he's a good songwriter. You can tell it's not. They're not just, you know, we're not gonna like. We're just going to start fresh, and this is what right. we come up with. No, you, you don't do that. You can't do that, right? I mean, all those – yeah, you're, you're right, because all the grunge bands were just, like, super into Neil Young and just, like – you know, they, they were all – you know, shit. How many grunge bands referenced a Neil Young lyric in their songs? At Absolutely. Point? Yeah, you look at Eddie Vedder, right? Like, he's total, like, Neil Young, Springsteen. Like, he, he loves those guys, right? So that's that shaped a lot of, uh, I think, the grunge people. So you know, even if yes, yeah, so go back to the grunge guys and trace those back, right? Like right. where do they? Yeah. So uh, you mentioned Springsteen. I feel like we have to just you know at least touch. Yeah, upon. we should you talk. Have, yeah. You got you got a Springsteen podcast, and so we we met through uh through fandom of uh, of Rocky, but uh, you have the Springsteen podcast. Tell Springsteen, the folks a little yeah. bit about that. Yeah, Tramps Like Us, a Bruce Springsteen podcast. I started this about five six years ago, and it was when I was kind of wasn't really doing anything with my music, right? I was kind of in that a void it wasn't really doing much and i just needed some sort of creative output and i just seen springsteen recently and i was just loved it and i wanted to kind of bring my fandom to a new level and i was listening to a lot of podcasts and i want to kind of to get in on this community and have these conversations back and forth like we're doing and uh you know i thought that you know there's not a springsteen podcast and i could do that and he's got a, such a you know a vast career that you can talk about and, and such a rabid fan base that would eat this up so i started doing these springsteen podcasts which have been fun i'm up almost to uh episode 100 that'll be coming soon we're going to do a whole episode just on the song born to run for episode 100 and i've also started doing side casts too called rocking and rolling and whatnot where i can talk about you know non-springsteen kind of stuff rock and roll artists and other kind of you know, things like that I like. And, uh, yeah, we met through the, the National Rock and Pod, that sort of event that's been going on three or four years now, and that whole community of people and, you know, like-minded guy. You're a, you're a cool cat, right? You like you like Springsteen, you like Rocky. So, right. uh, <laughs> but, but, the, but the big question is, hey, you're, so your guest, too, you're following up uh, Norwegian Elsa. Have you seen Frozen yet? I haven't seen that yet. <laughs> the, the, the expression <laughs> on your face says it all. Uh, Frozen Two. I need to see. Do I need to see Frozen One, or can I just jump into it? Frozen uh, you, Two. You, you, you can't just jump in. It's like. <sighs> it's so like, I got com- It's like okay. Could you watch Rocky Two without Rocky One? You could, but yes. but it's a it's a it's not a good idea. So I got to commit like a good like four hours now to this saga. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. If you if you skip the short films. Things are. Do you ever notice like how long? like programs are and like all these, these television shows As and we're doing documentaries long form podcast. Fuck. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like everything is like 10 hour documentary, like six hours, seven hey man, hours. The last like, dance was perfect. Like that, you know, I, I love, okay. I, I, I could have done another yeah. 10 episodes of that shit. That was amazing. Yeah. I loved it. Every moment of it. I wish there were another 10 too, but you know, they could have, you know, condense that down to a two hour documentary. No, that no would way, have been no way. Last dance was perfect. I was like every week, like this is, this is the most important two hours of my yeah. week is last dance. But it was weird too. Like within, like, cause that one week I watched, uh, I watched survive surviving R Kelly, which was just horrible, but that one was like way too long too. I was like eight hours. Like, come on. You could, and then I had that, uh, Jeffrey Epstein guy or whatever. I watched that uh, one. That was another eight hours. So do you have, are you, are you, do you have Netflix then? Yeah. Yeah, That's we, what I mean. Like every docu series on there's like, yeah, we got Netflix. Let's make it ten hours long. Yeah, because we only have uh, we only have Disney Plus. We don't have Netflix. Uh, you know, we just like, okay. did did the one stream. But you, I could watch uh, Last Dance on ESPN.com. So that was like every week. Like you know, first thing. It's so good. Oh, dude, it was. The the biggest bummer for me is like I just wanted to keep going like you know what shit talk about him in the Washington Wizards just like keep going with the Michael Jordan story like I wasn't done. Like, I'm not a big sports fan. I'm more of a music guy, obviously. You know, it's, you know, usually it's music or sports. Well, you know, I loved sports when I was a kid, like hockey in the 80s. I loved baseball in the 90s. And, you know, the, the basketball in the 90s with the Bulls. Like, I remember those those games so much. And just the way they would, um, you know, talk about the past and then compare it with, with this uh, this year that they're following and, and all right. the footage they got, oh, was, right? It's was just so, amazing. That was oh. really brilliant. And the, I think the thing that, you know, I – can't stress enough is that I feel like it is impossible to have been alive in the 90s and not be excited about the Chicago Bulls. 
Like if you were just It like, wasn't truly amazing. Right. Well it's Michael Jordan, right? Like right. you couldn't believe how good this guy was, right? He's just incredible. Like even and if you you're see not a sports that... guy, just you know, there's there's yeah. something about just like mastery of the craft where even if you're not a music guy, like yesterday is gonna make you cry. Where you're just like that is just a damn beautiful song. You just recognize mastery of the craft or you hear a Dylan song and you look at yeah. Michael Jordan, just like even if you don't like basketball, which I like basketball, I'm not like a, a super fan, but I definitely enjoy watching it and I enjoy the history and stuff. Like you just watch that and you're just like he's like a moving piece of art the way he plays the game. Yeah, I love that he kind of revealed like some of his incentive and like mm-hmm. what motivated him. And it, he all he was always looking for somebody to piss him off, somebody right. to say something to him, right? Like there's that one part where uh, he's having dinner and, and the like the the owner of the other team is in there and he kind of just snubs him as he walks by. And Michael <laughs> Jordan's like, okay, yeah, that's all I need, man, <laughs> right? And he just uses that to like just destroy the next game with the guy, right? <laughs> Yeah, just there's something to, you know, just that that mindset of just like the killer and the determination where just like he's not the guy I'd maybe want to hang out with, but you just respect like there's certain like yeah, guys. He's so good, disciplined right. and, you know, like Prince, like I don't know if I would have wanted to hang out with Prince, you know, from what I've heard, he could be like kind of a jerk to people. Uh, but you just respect like, you know, that level of genius and artistry with the craft. You're just like, shit, you're just that good. You know what? Like. I might not want to party with you, but I'm definitely going to crank up your records, you know? Well, I mean, there's a lot of artists like that. I mean, like, you know, a lot of artists have that sort of uh, disturbed mindset, like they're troubled geniuses and all that stuff too, right? right? So, you know, that's, it's, 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 it's tough sometimes when you meet your heroes. Fortunately, I haven't really had any bad experiences, but, you know, like I, I've just been watching this Chuck Berry documentary. And I mean, I love Chuck Berry, but as far as a human being, he's not a very – you know, right. quality human being, but he's, you know, he's, he's an, he's an, icon. I'm just sort of fascinated by him in general. So, uh, but yeah, he's not, a, he's not, he's no, uh, he's no Bruce Springsteen, right? Like, right. You know, it's better when you have the heroes that you can just like as a person and their art is amazing. Like that's the win. Uh, so, yeah, you know, when sure, you get a yeah. Bruce, like, like Bruce Springsteen, just like, is he, I've heard zero bad stories about him. Ever, you never. Yeah, you never hear like you think of. He's been around for fifty years. You'd hear that one moment where you, you think at least like somebody. somebody would, yeah, at least like someone would like. Someone would have been like a, a jerk fan and just like bugged him when he was busy and like then so yeah. and he was a jerk to me because like he was eating dinner with his wife and I asked him for an autograph. Like, well, yeah, he was eating dinner with his wife. You know, you hear stories like that, but never one story bad about Springsteen that I've ever heard. It's always like, yeah, he was super nice. The end. <laughs> Yeah, I had a I had Willie Nile on my show recently. Willie Nile's a recording artist, and he's played with Bruce Springsteen a bunch of times, and they're kind of uh, kind of friends. And you know, Willie's he told me he was hanging out with Bruce a few times, and they were driving up to Bruce's mansion or whatever. And Willie was like, "Bruce, look at this! Like, isn't it amazing what rock and roll did for you?" And Bruce was like, "Hey, man, you know, I I, I don't take it for granted. I, I think I think that every day. I'm so grateful every day. I I I, I know that right. So." You know, that's the way he lives his life. He's he's a great guy, I think, you know. Yeah, it's like when I you know, when I saw McCartney live, and I know he does this at a lot of shows, but he just like stops, looks at the crowd and just says, I'm just taking it in. And like to me that's just that's I love just you. super cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, good stuff, man. All right, and uh, you know what? Uh, I think uh, a good way to, to close out for the folks at home, uh, Rocky versus Rambo, who wins your heart? Well, we've, we've had this discussion right. before. We're big but, but, Stallone fans. But for, but for the people Ra- who don't know, for the people who are yeah. you know, meeting you for the first time through this show. No, for, absolutely, absolutely. Rocky wins my heart, man. Rocky's my hero. As, as far as a fictional hero could can be a, a, a hero to me, I just love the character so much. I get so much out of those movies. Out of him as a, as a character, the... The motivation he has, the, the the man he sort of became in this movie. Like, I know it's just a movie, but it just means so much to me. And I just love the entire saga. I think it's just, uh, I have Rocky tattooed on my on my body, right? I think it's... Where's Rocky I love tattooed? It. Oh, I got him on my leg. Can you, can you see that? It's got the... Uh, oh, yeah, there we go. Like I the, see uh, it. That's the uh, Rocky Six. When he's at the steps there, yeah. <laughs> it's actually called Rocky Balboa, technically. I know. I like <laughs> I Rocky Six, man. No, I like Rocky, Rocky Six better. <laughs> R- yeah, Rocky man, Six, love... puncher's chance. <laughs> yeah. Rocky's the greatest, man. Like, I literally watch those movies once a year, you know. like you know. But Rambo's great, too. Rambo's badass. But, uh, you know, Rocky steals my heart, for sure. 
I mean, yeah, I mean, if look, if it wasn't for Frozen, it'd still be my number one franchise. But damn, <laughs> the 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 charm of those sisters just they you know warmed my frozen heart. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm gonna have to uh, get back to you on that. Uh, you know what? I I can see uh, I can see it not working for you, but you'd probably be like, okay, I see why this works for Greg. You know what I have a hard time with? I don't know if it's because I'm older. I don't know what it is, but watching animation, I can't sustain. It doesn't sustain me for like. After half an hour, I'm like, oh, I feel like can we watch some real live action stuff now? You know, you know I, I, I get that. Um, with me personally, like the way I look at animation versus live action is yeah. that it, it's all based upon the individual quality of the piece. So, like, because I, I watch like a lot of Japanese animation and stuff too, and a lot of that is more geared towards adults than maybe Western yeah. animation. And so, like, when people say, oh, I'm a fan of anime, the thing is, there's anime that's for kids. And there's anime that's trash. It's and it's the same as saying I like television when like Survivor is a TV show and The Last Dance is a TV show, and they're just yeah. so different in terms of quality. So that's kind of how I am with animation. So it's just like a lot of animation is crap, and then just some of it is amazing. So it really like it depends on the individual thing. Just you know, same with any TV show or yeah. movie. Like you know, you and I, you know, we both love action movies, but you know, there's some trash action movies that you're just like, oh, oh geez, sure, what yeah. am I watching? But it's a fine so line, though, right? Because sometimes right. some of those, like, canon group action films oh, are, are amazing. Are, they're amazing on a different level, though, right? Or uh, the hey, Death Cobra, Wish movies. Hey, Cobra is a canon uh, group. Cobra, yeah. And Cobra's a, canon. Yeah, it's an absolute stone-cold classic masterpiece of cinema. Those Charles Bronson Death Wish movies, I love those. You right. Know? Uh, the, have you ever seen the, the Substitute franchise? Uh... No. Is it, like, a substitute teacher? Substitute teacher, uh, where basically <laughs> it's just... The the first two movies are just the same movie, but movie two they just cast a different actor for it, and then they had the secondary actor like be in all the other movies. But it's basically just every movie, just like a substitute teacher is really a cop going around yeah. kicking ass, and then just like fights neo Nazis in the fourth one. It's just there was just a marathon on TV one day, and I just watched all of them. Just like this is amazing. <laughs> I have to look, add that to my list. I'll do those after the Frozen one right. and two series. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, I'm, I'm, all, I'm all into the campy stuff. I think, you know, the, the campy action movies are fun, but there's sort of, um, you know, th there's a fine line. There's fun campy, line, and then right? yeah. there's like there's the yeah. campy where it's just like, ah, oh, this is dumb. Like, you need you need a star with some charisma who it's gotta have, yeah, a, some lit off some steam, factor. Bennett. You know, you, you, yeah. need, you need to have, like, some, the actor with the, some charisma. So you, like, they the wink needs to be, I think, a little bit acknowledged. Like, if they, if they, don't, if they don't acknowledge the wink, maybe that's sort of the problem. Yeah, or, or sometimes you just got to go deep, deep into it. Serious, man. Charles Bronson, right? <laughs> right, just smacking people with a blackjack left and right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, man, uh, you know, one more time, tell the folks at home where they can find you all your cool stuff. Yeah, thanks, man. Well, yeah, Tramps Like Us, the Bruce Springsteen podcast, you can listen to that on all the plat podcast platforms, and the website is TrampsLikeUsPod.com. But please check out my music, specifically my new single, Train to Heartbreak. Uh, the B-side is every night's a Saturday night. You can find information on that, about how to buy the vinyl at moonviolet.com. Uh, you can listen to it on Apple Music. You can download it there. You can stream it on Spotify. Uh, check out the video on YouTube. We did a cool video there where we kind of shot, you know, in the studio. So it's uh, it's cool to see me actually in the studio recording, you know, in, in Sun Studio in Memphis, right? So that turned out well. Take a, take a look at that on the YouTubes. And, uh yeah, that's it, man. Rock and roll. Thanks a lot, Greg. Uh, yeah, I ho hope you dig the song, man. I love it. No, I mean, I, I definitely like the song, and I'm um, looking forward to listening to it again on my crappy record player. But also, uh, you know, I do I did watch the video, too, because, like, you know what? I My crappy record player is so crappy. Let me actually hear what it's supposed to sound like. <laughs> but you know what? Maybe it is supposed to have that uh, sort of, uh, you know, once again, the, the majesty of the vinyl. So I just yeah, got to get a better speaker system. My speaker system is crap. <laughs> Yeah, like I want to hear it. Like I want to put it on a cassette tape or something like that, and I want to hear it in like, uh, like a '58 Buick or something like that. Like coming out of a stereo or, or like a car radio, or like a one speaker dashboard. You know, cassettes like are coming 52 back, man. '52 coupe. Yeah, I, well, yeah, I got a bunch of cassettes. Well, no, in terms of physical media, I've got a buddy who runs a record label, and really? cassettes sell way better than everything else. Sell better than CD. Sell better than vinyl. And it's fun, man. People are having fun with this nostalgic, with you know. So everything's come, CDs will be back. Yeah, everything's yeah. gonna come back around, you know. Uh, see, I don't know, man. I feel like cassettes, like as far as like formats, like in the hierarchy of things that should come back, 
like cassettes it's like what yeah, these things not... that are bad were through winding and like yeah they're portable but we have better portable things now yeah, like exactly, I, I get yeah. the appeal of vinyl because you get the the earthy sound something about you know holding it feels cool and cds i think they're like mini vinyls in a way and plus you know you have the album artwork you can open up the booklet but with cassettes like they're so damn small just like this isn't that cool like in my opinion like yeah. i mean i have a lot of cassettes and there's just some great music that i have that you know i have on cassette like you know Blue Tears, the only physical copy of that album I was able to find that was on cassette. So, like, I get it, but it's like, I don't know, of, of all the ones that could make a comeback, it's like, seriously, like, you know, at least it's not 8-track, which is just the absolute worst, but... Yeah, that's the absolute worst, you know, uh... Yeah, cassettes are, cassettes are fun, and I think it's mostly a nostalgic thing, but, you know, I'm good with, you know, records, and yeah. actually my, my favorite is vinyl and then digital, right? Like, if I can have a vinyl with a download card, that's perfect, so I can keep portable and i can have it on my my phone or whatever and take it in the car and play it wherever i want but i like to have that physical copy still yeah right? like i don't feel like i own it if i don't physically have it you know yeah i mean i i get it i mean i i grew up in the cd generation and so because i had you know cds and like that was my thing and it's still sort of my thing because i have the nostalgia for it but you know i've got my record collection uh, so, you know, the, the, the CD collection is the biggest because that's just, you know, when I grew up. But, I mean, mm -hmm. at this point, I mean, I don't buy CDs because, like, wh why would I buy a CD when I can, you know, if I'm going to buy something, buy the vinyl because that's the cooler package. Well, I go back and forth, right, because the vinyl is still too expensive, right? New records right. are like 30 40 bucks, right? A CD you can get for like 10 12 bucks, And I like CDs because... You know, if like box sets and compilations and yeah. things where there's bonus Ooh, tracks and rarities yeah. and you got with stuff where you want all that stuff. Like I just bought a Stax uh, box set that had every uh, single from the 68, every A side and B side from 1968. It's like uh, four CDs and like 30 songs. Like if that was on vinyl, that would be like a 12 record set, like $300. But, you know, I got the CD box set for 40 bucks and it's, it's amazing. Big booklets and everything. Beautiful, right? So I like to go back and forth between, you know, certain records, like, you know, classic records from your favorite artists. You want that album on vinyl, but then, like, you want the box set on CD so you can get all the bonus tracks and you don't have to spend $500 or something stupid, right? Yeah, no, it's uh, – the the economics of music is so bizarre nowadays. But I, w I will say this. Frozen 2, I only have the I only have the vinyl. I don't have it on CD yet. So there wow. you go. But I'm single-handedly supporting the music industry, yeah. <laughs> buying all this stuff, buying records for four times that I've you know bought over the years. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that are like, ah, oh, fuck, I gotta buy this record again. Come on, you know. But <laughs> there are th certain things that th sure, fuck, there are, <laughs> there are certain things that I have like cassette, vinyl, CD. And then I got the reissue on vinyl, right. you know, <laughs> it's nuts. <laughs> there's like, there's a couple albums that I've lost over the years that I, I want to rebuy, but I'm always too broke to buy them and streaming as a thing. So I'm like, yeah. shit, I want, you know, cause I lost, um, a poison CD and a triumph CD and a car wreck, uh, lost the Shrek two soundtrack to a friend who just gave it back, scratched it all hell. And then I just don't know what happened to that one Dragon Force CD I had. So I'm like, shit, I want to buy these CDs again. But also, all of them are readily available through streaming, and I'm broke. So never mind. And then every time like, I'm at yeah. the, I'm at the, C the U CD store in Nashville, which is really great. Next time you're in town, you got to check out. The, it's like this two-story like CD music store, like lots of great stuff, records, CDs. Uh, it's called yeah. McKay, um, which hopefully you know survives this pandemic and stays in business. But... Um, you know, yeah, I, I gotta see, come down I, earlier next time. Every yeah, gotta, time I come to Nashville, I'm always pressed for time because there's so much I want to do. I gotta come down for like an extra day next time. Yeah, right? come come for an extra day. We'll we'll go record shop and I'll show you around. But like, I, I see the CD there. I'm like, man, Poison. I can buy the CD again for ten bucks, or I can get this Springsteen album I never had on CD for three bucks. <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah. man. Which also. Oh, like, one you know, day, man. There's there's time. You'll just put. Make a list and just put it on your list. And <laughs> there's, there's, there's never there. You're the list will never be complete because then more stuff gets added to it. Yeah, so, I've, I've had a hunt list for about six years that I keep now, like the, on this Word document. And as I buy things, I move off, and as I want things, I add them there. And just what I see it. I've been looking for the First Blood uh, soundtrack on vinyl for ten years now. I never see that one. I see it came up on Discogs maybe about six months ago, but it was in Italy. Right, and the record was thirty bucks. I'm like, oh, I would buy it for thirty bucks. But, but then, then you shipping, gotta pay the shipping. Shipping is like forty bucks, and I'm like, I can't do it, man. So 
Yeah, no, One I mean, I, I bought some of those uh, import albums back in high school, and like that was when I was like, you know, a kid not paying rent, and so I'm like, yeah, I'll buy this, you know, German CD for 40 bucks, why not? And now that I'm like a grown adult with rent, I'm like, I'm not buying these imports, man. <laughs> My first much. import, I bought Kiss Music from the Elder in probably 1988. 87, 88, somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. And I never heard the album. You couldn't find it on vinyl. It was just like, I'd never seen this it. This elusive, it was, mysterious album. Yeah, it was this one weird album I'd never heard of. And there was like, it was like I got to hear this. And the only way you could get it was like, they could order it from Japan. So I got them to order it for me and it came and it was like $55. And this is 1988. So that's right. almost like, that's, that's like, that's, like a, that's crazy, right? That's crazy. So, so I did, I laid down my money and I'm like, I got to have it, right? And I took it home. And it's just like, oh, God damn it. I paid so much money for this piece of shit. Right? <laughs> you paid so but much money cool for my favorite it, Kiss album. Yeah, it's like, it's cool. I mean, like, I enjoyed it because of that. And, you know, how I, I forced myself to like it because I spent so much <laughs> money on it, right? I, I kind of had a similar know. thing where, like, I couldn't find it for the longest time because I would, like, go, I would drive to all these different stores in Cleveland, Ohio. And it's like, do you guys have this Kiss CD, Music from the Elder? And the store clerk always looked like me, looked at me like I was fucking insane each time. What is that? It's <laughs> like, what is that? And so, like, eventually, you know, finding a copy online. Uh, but, the, you know, that was, like, my big quest to find music from The Elder. <laughs> like, I feel like yeah. so many KISS fans have that sort of, like, I couldn't find a copy of The Elder. And then people I don't understand, it. man. Right. Yeah. People, don't, people don't understand what it's like to, like, there's music out there and you just can't have access to it. Like, now all you got to do is, t- you know, type it on YouTube and you can listen to it. A, a few some, more clicks and it'll be delivered to your stuff. door. There's, there's still some stuff that, you know, you have to dig deeper for that. You know, those rare finds I mean, are kind of exciting. But I mean, back then, all you had were record stores and the radio, right? right. Like, that's all you had. And the one thing, you would go to a record store, and some some of the record stores would have the order book, right? The big, thick phone book, and you would just flip through it. And I mean, that was probably where I found music from the Elder. I just looked up Kiss, and I said, oh, music from the Elder. And then, the, oh, we have to order that from Japan kind of thing, right? But, uh, you know, that was the thing. Like, you would... You know, uh, magazines and books, and you would hear about these records, but you would never see them in record stores and stuff like that. Or you'd you'd have to go to the the uh, the huge record store downtown compared to the one in the suburbs because they had you know a bigger selection and hope that it's there. You know, <laughs> so much fun. I love records. Right. You know, I, how much time do you have left? Uh, I got a few more minutes. We can talk. All right. So I want to do a lightning round of going through Kiss albums because I realize we've never like right. formally done that. So right. lightning round thoughts on <laughs> uh, Kiss albums. We're just going to go through them. First album, go. That's my favorite probably besides the live record, Alive. The first one, that was the first record I ever owned when I was five years old. I went to, uh, I was looking through my uncle's records and I saw that cover and I put it on and I, played it two or three times and i went up to him and i was like can i have this and you know that's i love that record. that's a 10 out of 10 all right hotter than hell that's a really good one too that's another 10 out of 10 you know with the production obviously everybody talks about the production but you know i don't mind it it gives it some character man there's some amazing songs on that one love hotter than hell uh dress to kill no that's another 10 out of 10 too probably my second favorite record besides alive you know after the first one uh, it's, i love that it's so quick it's like 28 minutes or whatever that it's so rocking and that record uh, i think ace and peter really shine on uh that album for sure all right alive specifically the hundred thousand years drum solo oh my god well <laughs> alive live is my favorite kiss album that album is perfect and that drum solo peter chris man he just uh that's that's incredible i was able to meet peter once and i mentioned how much that song means to me and i talk to him about how the influence of Gene Krupa and he's like oh yeah I was fully thinking Gene Krupa when I'm playing my solo and stuff yeah so come on alive that's incredible that's that their best record for sure all right and uh Destroyer how do you feel about that one Destroyer is a great one that's probably like an eight out of ten I would give that one you know it's probably my least favorite of the six original uh studio records but I mean Detroit Rock City as uh, as, uh, some want to call it (laughs) Yeah, all that stuff. It's great. Yeah, it's good, but it's not not out of the six. It's probably my least favorite. And uh, I do love Beth, man. Peter Chris. Yeah, Beth man. Rules. All right. So my favorite of the of the of the OG six, Rock and Roll Over. Thoughts? Yeah, that's a great one. Uh, you know, I don't love it the way everybody else is. Just like, yeah, that's my favorite one because I love the early, the first three records, that sort of the black and silver era before they kind of got more comic booky. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, that's a great record. I think it's missing. Uh, an, an ace influence he needs an ace song or or something like that because that's c- kind of missing on that one for me but it's yeah that's a that's a classic that's a great one 
that's an okay nine out of ten. All right, and uh, Love Gun is uh, is that a ten out of ten? Because it has an A song. Yeah, this is nine out of ten. It's you know, nine I like out of ten. It. Yeah, that'll probably be my fourth favorite, or maybe my, I might like that one a bit more than uh, Hotter Than Hell. I don't know. I love the drum sound on that record. Eddie Kramer, you know the way Peter plays, and you know Shock Me. That's a great record. Love Gun. Whew. All right, solo albums. Before we get to the solo albums, Alive 2, Side 4, Peter Chris is playing on that. I know a lot of people have said, is that Anton Fink? That's fucking Peter Chris on all of that, okay? All right. Larger Than Life, that's Peter Chris. No, I, I, so, I, I think that's definitely Peter on, yeah, it's on all the songs. That's very Peter Chris. If you listen to the snare jumps, like, the way, like I was telling you about Love Gun and the way that snare sounds, the way Peter hits his snare has got a certain crack, the way he would hit the skin and the rim at the same time, and the Eddie Kramer... The way he would produce those drums is definitely Peter. Man. Oh yeah, it's it's very clearly Peter. And the, the thing is, like, Anton has a different swing to his playing than Peter does. It's, they they just they feel different. You can just tell. Yeah, and they hadn't met yet. The first time Ace and Anton met was when they were doing Ace's solo record. Right. That was that wasn't even there yet. Yeah. So solo records. Do uh, you want me to rank them or? Uh... Nah, just uh, nah. You don't need to. Just general thoughts okay. on them. I love Aces. Aces is probably my second or third favorite Kiss record. That's a top five Kiss record for me. Is Aces. That one's great. Now Paul's is all right. That's a little. Uh, that's a little Paul Stanley, but that's a that's a it's good a little, one. It's a little Paul Stanley. That's I mean, like it's, it's what you it's what you would expect, right? I mean, the Ace one blew everybody away when that one came out. I don't think uh, people expected it to be that great. You know what? I would always love to have noted. I don't know if anyone's ever asked Paul and Gene this. Like, when was the first time they heard Ace's record? Because I'm sure they thought it was going to suck. Right. Right? And then they put his on, and the first track they listened to was Rip It Out. They must have been like, oh, fuck. Right? right. <laughs> <laughs> and then the whole, like, whole side one is just like, oh, my God. Right? Like, he's just totally killed it. Um, so, yeah, Ace's great. Peter Paul's is really good. I love Peter's a lot because, I mean, it sounds like Peter Chris. I love Peter's a guy. You know, that's kind of how I feel with that record, even though it's probably, you know, it's not a good Kiss record, you know. And Jeans is awful. Like, there's some moments on it, but Jeans is kind of a mess. All right, uh, Dynasty, were you still a fan at that point? Yeah, that was kind of my entry point. Right? I, that was 79, I was five years old, and I my first Kiss records were Kiss and Alive and Love Gun, and I got those in 79. But at the same time, like, I was going to the store and I was buying, like, uh, Kiss Viewmaster and Kiss posters, and that was all Dynasty stuff, right? So I love Dynasty. I had Dynasty on 8-track. That was my first thing. And, uh, yeah, I love that record. Even I Was Made For Loving You is great. And, you know, the rest of the stuff is pretty hard rocking, like Hard Times and Save Your Love and Charisma and Magic Touch. It's, that's a rocking record. Yeah, Unmasked. Unmasked is like a step down from Dynasty. The production's weak on it. Like, there's some great songs on it. Tomorrow is awesome. Right. Right, Shandy's all right. It's missing because there's no Peter Chris on, element on it, obviously. You know, we got Anton Fig playing drums, and uh, you know, some of the A songs are a little bit, they're cool, but they're you know, a step down from the stuff he was doing on the solo record and Dianne. But uh, you know, Unmass is still a good one. All right, and uh, Killers. Killers is cool. I didn't have that for the longest time. I think the first time I heard Nowhere to Run is I had uh, Kiss Forever a cassette single, and I think. The B side was had uh, uh, nowhere to run, or something like that. I had a cassette tape, and I was like, hey, "Where are these songs from?" And then I found out they were the, from Killers, and I never had Killers. And I got it recently, and uh, yeah, that's a good one. I mean, those four songs are all right. Nowhere to run is really good. The other three are kind of bad, <laughs> but uh, I love the cover, the pink right yeah. with the elder costumes and the kind of uh, killer and the blue kind of jaggedy fonts, kind of neat. Now, uh, how about creatures? I, mean, I I don't know. How big are you of are you of a metal guy? Like, how did you feel about creatures? Yeah, I love creatures. Creatures in my top five Kiss records, and you know that was the first time I saw the band, 1983 at Maple Leaf Gardens. That tour, I was eight years old. My dad took me, and I was a huge fan. I remember going to the store and seeing that cover, like on the on the rack, and all the other records of the day. But then you just see that bluish kiss face with the eyes and you're just like holy shit i want that right give it to me and the video i love it loud was being played on videos all over and that was just such a hypnotic video literally right i would just sit in front of the tv like the kid in the tv watching the band right and my dad would be like watching me get mesmerized by kiss on this tv and they just look so badass playing on that big uh tank stage right so yeah i love the whole era that album is heavy you know the tour with vinnie vincent and eric carr was amazing 
All right, and uh, you know, we'll just go through the, the I feel like you probably have uh, sort of similar feelings about the non-makeup era album. So lick it up through Hot in the Shade. General thoughts on those. If you want to get into any specifics on the certain albums. I mean, I like Lick It Up a lot. I saw that tour as well. Uh, I, that's when I kind of dropped out of Kiss. Uh, well, actually, Animalize, I liked Heavens on Fire. I, I bought the record. Asylum, I kind of didn't pay attention. But then I saw Exposed, the video, and I was like, ah, oh, these guys are cool again. <laughs> and then I got Crazy Nights for Christmas, and I kind of like Crazy Nights. And then I got Hot in the Shade, and I didn't really like Hot in the Shade, but the tour for that was really good, you know? So, so uh you know, I've always been a Kiss fan. I've always followed them, but there's just a little like peaks, peaks and, valleys and valleys in the '80s. There, yeah. Was re- was Revenge that uh, big comeback for you? A little bit. I mean, they were getting bigger around that time. That's when they were kind of uh, embracing some of their roots. They were putting out like video collections, like they had that extreme close-up doc where they had all that old footage and stuff like that, and they were preparing the tribute album. But when it, oh yeah, when I heard Unholy, that was like, oh, that's a fucking badass song, right? And uh, you know, I like the album when it came out then, but it's, you know, and honestly, it doesn't really hold up. It's like, yeah, you know, I, it, when, when I go back to it, it's not like I remember it as this big Kiss Revenge comeback I, album. I feel like know? it's more the production of that album than maybe the songs itself. Like, I think there's a lot of filler on yeah. it. I think there's some really great songs, but I think it's more just like, whoa, heavy guitar tone. Uh, speaking of heavy guitar tone, Carnival of Souls, man. Ah, shit. I remember <laughs> I bought it. I remember I bought it because it came out right when like Kiss Reunion was happening, and I was such a huge Kiss fan all over again, and I was buying everything that had Kiss on it, including Carnival of Souls. But I remember just buying that in the midst of this huge Kiss 70s reunion comeback and just being like, why would they? This is awful. And, you know, I wasn't a big fan of the whole, like, 90s grunge era Alice in Chains kind of vibe. So, uh, yeah, that, that record absolutely does nothing for me. I like Jungle a little bit, but... Uh, that's about it, yeah. Yeah, ironically, uh, you know how much I don't like grunge, and Carnival's a top five Kiss album for me, so. Really? Yeah. I'm I a weirdo. Know. <laughs> you know, I, I listen to all the Kiss podcasts, and I listen to people analyze it, and I still can't really grab a hold of anything. Yeah, I mean, I I get it's not for everyone. It just, maybe it works for me, because maybe because Kiss is bad at playing grunge is why I like it. Yeah. <laughs> because grunge fans are just like, this isn't real grunge, and I'm just like, this isn't real grunge, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, you know what? We'll just uh, go through the last three: Psycho Circus, Sonic Boom, and Monster. Well, Psycho Circus, I wanted to love. Right, that's part of the the whole Kiss reunion. And I remember hearing Psycho Circus on the radio for the first time, and just being like, "Oh, that's totally like a Kiss riff, and it sounds like a Kiss song." But then, you know, buying the album. You know, I remember I heard, I heard Into the Void and being like, oh, that sounds like Kiss. But then the rest of them, like, the production was so weird. And well, that's because that like was them. the only one that Peter played drums on was yeah, Into the Void. Absolutely. Yeah, we found that out later. But, uh, you know, like, with each repeated listen, I kind of, you know, like that album even less. So it, that one doesn't hold up. But, uh, you know, it's such a mess. They they were lying to us. That's when I was realizing, you know, this what this band really is. You know? <laughs> They're about money. <laughs> yeah. And Sonic Boom, I mean... That's when I was really like, I didn't want to like this band at all. Like, I don't like 21st Century Kiss. You know, I always say my fandom for wrestling, Kiss, and Star Wars ended in the 20th century. You know, I wish they would have just done that farewell tour and left. But, uh, you know, I saw them in 2003 with Aerosmith on that tour, and Peter was there, so that was kind of cool. And then I gave them one more shot. I, I saw the tour where they opened, uh, Poison opened up for them, and that was with Tommy and Eric Singer. And I just had just just this terrible feeling in my stomach. Right. I just felt so bad there. And I'm just like, okay, never again. And you know, that's so yeah. ironic because that's the show. That was the tour that turned me into a music fan. That was my first concert. Really? So we wouldn't be friends without that Poison Kiss tour. So, like, yeah. without that Tommy and Eric lineup, we might not know each other, bro. Maybe, yeah. Who knows where the past would have went, right? right? But then the Sonic Boom came out, and I remember Modern Day Little Isle. I was like, yeah, that's all right. Maybe I'll give it a chance. And then I bought the CD. And it just sounded like rehashed, like yeah. they were trying to be 70s Kiss. And then the one thing that just really made me mad is that second disc of them uh, oh, redoing God. all of the classic, Those the classics ta- or whatever. That is terrible. I, that is, that I is just the was like, of the barrel of the catalog. That is so bad. I think I just imported it into my, my MacBook, my iTunes or whatever collection. And as soon as I heard it, I was just like, delete. Delete, delete. We did, we right? did a, we did a two-parter on that on the Lipstick panel, and yeah, that was after it, we did a, like five hours of podcast. Like we, yeah, we did the Star Wars podcast with you. Yeah, we did that, and then that was the week that Neil Peart died, so we recorded the Neil Peart tribute, right. and then we recorded like you know three hours talking about that piece of shit album, 
And like, and at, I mean, the, at the end of like, it, I broke and just started screaming because I was so angry because I'm not a Star Wars guy. New yeah. Pert was dead and I was sad and I just spent three hours talking about it. Talking about this, I know. <laughs> and I mean, I, I get it if they're doing it because they want to use these tracks and like commercials and they want to keep all the publishing on it. And I know why bands do that. They re-record stuff like that for those reasons. But, you know, as a Kiss fan, come on, man. Like you're going to... rough. Oh, really God damn it. Oh, so terrible. So yeah. terrible. And Monster, uh, I, I've, I've never, I never owned that. I never really listened to it the whole way through. That Hell or Hallelujah song was kind of all right. Kind of reminded me of like, uh, I Stole Your Love meets Animalize kind of yeah. thing. But I think Monster yeah. is much better than Sonic Boom because it feels like a more organic and real record. Like it just felt like yeah. they were having fun with it versus like Sonic Boom felt really forced. But Monster, I mean, shoot, take me down below. Stone Cold Classic, absolute masterpiece of the catalog. I just, I just won't give him any more of my money. I'm just so disappointed. That's why you can stream it, bro. <laughs> I just can't the like, I just can't like it. I, like, I, I won't let them take away what I loved in in the 21st, 20th century, right? I'm not gonna let them ruin that stuff. But I don't want any part of what they've done with Tommy and Eric. It just really hurts my feelings, and I just think it's insulting to the fans that put them where they are. So I won't support it. But uh, whatever, you know. Well, there we go. We finally, we finally got it on record. You talking about Kiss with me? <laughs> finally, <laughs> I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll let you go. Uh, once All right, man. the single, I'm gonna, I'm putting it up on the screen right now. Yeah. Boom. Uh, train, train to heartbreak. Train to heartbreak. Great single. Go buy it. That's the episode. Bye, everyone. <laughs>